Hyde. And I'm Alex Gore. We're architects and run a practice called Price Gore. And this is the ninth episode in the Architecture Foundation series of films exploring significant architectural projects from the last 30 years. We're here at the Young Vic in London. It's a building you really need to experience and fosters an enormous sense of possibility. It's a building that feels ad hoc and in transition. It's very economically made, but with a great deal of care, it's woven into the fabric of the street. It's a building that grew up over many phases of development. There were three key phases. There's a Victorian building which survived a World War II bombing raid which destroyed the buildings around it. In 1970, Hal Killick, Partridge and Amos built the original Young Vic Theatre around the historic butcher's shop and house, using it as its entrance way. We all know the old Vic, but just down the road is the Young Vic. It was opened recently under the auspices of the National Theatre, especially to present plays for the younger generation. And in the early 2000s, architects Howarth Tompkins significantly expanded and reworked the site, taking a robust and critical approach to the architectural history. We met Steve Tompkins to talk about the project. Steve, I thought uh, one way to start might be for us to sketch out the history um, of the Young Vic before your involvement. And uh, you know the story better than us, so feel free to correct us um, during or after. Uh, does that sound okay to you? Sure, yeah, great, fire away. Okay, so uh, in the mid 60s, the Arts Council decided there should be a new theatre, a theatre specifically uh, aimed at youth. And the National Theatre, who were based at that point in the Old Vic, were asked to set this up with a budget of £60,000. Um, and they appointed uh, Frank Dunlop, uh, who's a progressive uh, theatre director, to set up this new young Vic. Um, he had a pretty free reign, uh, other than he had to find uh, a site close to the old Vic, as they were going to share some facilities. And initially he looked for a, uh, an existing building, uh, but he couldn't find one, and eventually he was offered this site on the cut just down the road from the old Vic um, at a very economic price. And uh, this site was uh, a bomb site. It was in use as a car park, uh, but previously it had been a street with uh, terraced houses with shops at their bottom. But during World War II, um, many of these houses were destroyed. Uh, 54 people lost their lives. Uh, and one building on the site was left standing, one house with, with the butcher's shop at the bottom. Frank Dunlop's idea was to get an agricultural building uh, on the site, an anti-architecture. He wanted something that was the opposite of the West End Theatre. He wanted something that was raw and that could appeal to, uh, to the working class youth of the area. But for building regs reasons, uh, we understand that wasn't really possible. And it's at that point that he turned to Bill Howell of HKPA to design something. And the brief was for a 450 seat auditorium, uh, various other facilities such as a bar, rehearsal rooms, uh, and so on. And the building was going to be temporary. It was only going to be there for five years. And this budget was extremely tight and that led to this very, very pragmatic design. It was all about how you could build something of this scale uh, for this amount of money. And that's led to this um, cheap, very cheap, simple concrete block building, no plaster, uh, surface mounted uh, services, uh, this external steel frame and so on. And uh, Dunlop described it as something between a tent and a gas works. Uh, but at the tender, it was still over budget. Uh, and at that point, only at that point, they decided not to demolish uh, the house on the site, the house, the butcher's shop. Uh, so that was retained as the welcome space, the entrance foyer, and uh, the theatre was built. Uh, obviously, it was pretty successful because it lasted over 30 years, even though it was meant to only be there five years. Um, in the mid 90s, under another director of the Young Vic, there was a plan to replace the buildings with a 
25 million pound scheme by John Porcel, we understand, although we've not seen any drawings of that ourselves as yet. Um, but in 2000, David Lamb uh, became the new director. There was also less money around uh, for public projects, we think. And he then set up uh, the competition for, for reworking the site, which is, of course, where you come in. The, the only thing probably to add, just in terms of the importance of the site in cultural memory, was that there, there was actually a bomb shelter on the site, um, which was uh, bombed and took a direct hit, which is why so yeah. many people were killed. And roughly where the auditorium um, now sits was, was effectively this, the site of that tragedy. So it's got a really sort of deep cultural resonance for, for the neighbourhood as well as being this sort of accidentally totemic theatre architecture, which, which kind of grew out of the fact that there wasn't enough money for proper architecture in, in one sense of the word. You know, this is, this is the time when the National was being built up the road. It was in conception. It was sort of halfway through its design life. Yeah. Um, and it was also the time when theatre practitioners were starting already to question whether architecture with a capital A was the right thing. You know, whether actually what architects thought was the appropriate semiotic, the, the appropriate signal, the appropriate polish for a public cultural building was actually any good to theatre practitioners. So the Young Vic is, I think, is really interesting. It's, it's a, it is a milestone of where theatre architecture would turn, really, for, for, the, for the subsequent decade. And it's still really strong, I think, coming back with a, with a vengeance now around provisionality, around economy, around the idea of maximum effect for minimum resource expenditure, you know, for obvious environmental as well as economic reasons, but also for, for artistic reasons. You know, a building which is not finishing all the stories, not crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's is of much more interest to another artist, of course, because they are able to overlay their own narratives, their own practice onto that, you know, awaiting space, that awaiting building, rather than try and confront the finished article, which is kind of hermetically sealed off by the architect. All the problems have been solved, all the recalcitrance has been bleached out by, by, by an impeccable design process on, on the one hand, but also a sterilizing process on the, yes. on the other hand. So, you know, for all those reasons, and as you say, this was not necessarily intentional for, by Bill Howell. It was pragmatic. It was, it was, it was being generated through circumstance. Yeah. Um, and yet, there, it, there it sits as this kind of inspiring building, and a really difficult building for us to engage with because it was kind of perfect and complete in its own terms. So, what do you do? Mm. You start again, like John Porson proposed, which was a as you say, which is, you know, a, a very beautiful, elegant, refined, rarefied space. Um, but it, yeah, it was, a, it was a white building with a big glass front. And, and so he, you know, his reaction was to not to try and extrapolate those, those values, that aesthetic, but to actually start again and reinvent, which valid in many ways. But for David, and I think probably for me as well, um, it felt like we should have a go at, at growing a new organism out of the, the DNA of this, of this old building and selectively retain and um, cherish the fragments which felt particularly significant. And, and, and those were the auditorium and the butcher shop, the relationship between those two objects. And we wondered, um, we wondered what state the building was in when you uh when you uh came across it we wondered uh because we understood hkpa had, had made had made a number of sort of small improvements over the years but i i mean i guess the original design was not lost was not compromised um but it it was presumably not performing very well still the fact that it had this single layer of concrete block in between the cut and the auditorium yeah, it, you know, it, environmentally, uh, it, it was nowhere near meeting building regs, it, it leaked, it was too hot in summer, too cold in winter, you know, all the usual things. Um, and when you look at funding applications for public subsidy, it always starts with the statement that, you know, the building is unusable, mm. 
we would have to close if it wasn't for the millions that we're asking for to to build a new building so you know you, you have to take this with a slight pinch of salt all the time but nevertheless <laughs> i think in the case of the young Vic, it's, it's probably more true than any other project i've ever worked on certainly um it was in a really parlous state and it was it was in the state you'd expect from a five-year you know design life that was by that time was was 30 odd years um, into its existence so ev everything was falling apart really um and the other difficulty was that the foyer was absolutely tiny i, I don't know if you ever went into the the old building no never it was um you know the butcher shop was a, a small domestic room and there was a kind of corridor which led to a bar then going off to the left as you walked through and so you know there was always a queue to get to the bar in the interval and there was always a queue to get to the loos and you could never go to the loo and get a drink in the interval you always had to decide which you'd have a go at and you didn't always succeed in either you know so it it wasn't really a functional public cultural space for 400 people um, and, and never was and that was part of its joy because it was always it always felt like an adventure you know, not only seeing the show but getting in and out and and getting around the place but it it, it had sort of stopped being funny and it and, and it just become a real really problematic for the organization which was obviously having to having to struggle to make a living um, yeah. and not really having a functional foyer not really having um, a second studio that that was particularly fit for purpose, terrible working conditions for staff and artists, you know, all of these things, a big shanty town of um, containers and um, makeshift storage out the back, which was, which was an eyesore for the neighbors and a security risk. All of these things kind of added up to the fact that however much affection one, one held for the building, it, it's kind of time was up and, and a new incarnation had to somehow be be worked through and that, and that really was the was the intellectual as well as the design and financial challenge for, for the team with led, led by david lan and by myself and roger watts my, my colleague who kind of co-designed the building and at, at this point so in i think it's 2002 i mean i think it would be useful for me to could you just sort of sketch out where your practice is and you know, are you already kind of embedded in a kind of world of theatre? Um, and, and what sort of qualified you to be on that shortlist, which was a, an interesting shortlist? Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, we we got a lucky break in the mid '90s. Um, we we got put on a shortlist to work on the Royal Court as as a complete wild card. We we got no track record, no particular experience, but we'd, we'd had some interesting conversations with somebody who at the time was in a position to suggest names for a shortlist, a theatre consultant, in fact, that was working with, with, with the Royal Court. Mm. But also, I guess, significantly for the Young Vic job, we'd done a couple of temporary spaces for the Almeida Theatre, one in, in King's Cross and one at Gainsborough Studios. Um, mm. And both of those were incredibly fast, light touch, very low budget, less than a million pounds each. Um, including full fit out, et cetera, et cetera. So they were quite similar to the Young Vic Commission in a way, artists led, working with makeshift space, found materials, bringing on production crews to make the work rather than a conventional contractor relationship, borrowing m and &E kit and giving it back at the end in, and for almost non-existent budgets. They kind of gave us an appetite for that language and it opened our eyes to the possibilities of a more provisional mm. attitude, a looser fit. You know, the Royal Court we we love, but it was a kind of homage to Scarpa, you know, every every mm. function, every edge, every layer was kind of meticulously, you know, delineated and conceived, and we were obsessed with with build quality. Um, at the Young Vic, we were obsessed in a different way. We were almost obsessed with provisionality as a build quality ra rather than um, exquisite resolution and and, and um, that opulent materiality that yeah. we were working with before. So we kind of, we've got a little bit of a track record and we felt we got something to say about the Young Vic particularly as a project. So when we went into the, the shortlist interviews for that, for that 
that project, I, I guess, we, yeah, we, we felt a reasonable amount of alignment um, with, with the values of, of the building and what we thought Powell and, and Dunlop had uh, been trying to get at in the first place. And um, was, the, was the brief specific? Was the brief, uh, you know, we must retain the butcher's shop, we must retain or partially retain part of the auditorium, or was it open to interpretation uh, from the very, form? Very, very much the latter, very much the latter. I, I think we almost lost the, the gig actually by proposing retaining the butcher's shop. I, as I understand it, I think, I think we might have been the only people on the shortlist that did proposed that and it and it probably felt like a really weak or naff or half-hearted kind of proposition if, if you're a trustee on the selection committee and you know it was it was a pretty hot shortlist let's face it and there were there was some serious horsepower and you know being directed at the at, a, at proposals and we kind of stepped back from that and we sort of said well let's let's ask the building what it would like let's let's ask the the values of the of, of the building and the, the original conception of the building how it would expect to be extrapolated by us and let's start off with a, a series of propositions and a conversation let's not start off with a a kind of um barnstorming cgi that blows everybody away we certainly didn't want to go in with a with a final proposal we wanted to go in with a with the beginnings of a conversation and hope that that was something that, that, that got some traction. We were obviously incredibly lucky to get that, what, what felt for us like a dream job, really, and still does. And your project, I mean, it has lots of, um, lots of echoes and memories of the existing building, um, even though comparatively little fabric was left. I mean, you did demolish, you know, substantial parts of it. And, uh, you know, I think the 20th Century Society um, were quite concerned and, and tried to list the building, as I understand it. Could you sort of talk a little bit about your approach to the historic fabric? Yeah, I mean, it's we've we've always had a reasonably tough love approach to to historic fabric, and you know, I think for us, the the fact that a building is listed kind of it kind of validates our our sense of the importance of the building, rather than feels like a um, feels like a a barrier to be overcome somehow it, you know it feels like we would always agree i mean i i, I would have agreed with the like young vic being listed you know it feels important as an idea it was important as a milestone so i think it it should be listed as a as a way of working but the actual physical manifestation of that idea if its time is up and if it needs to be extended i, I think the listing is an encouragement to understand the importance of the architecture rather than to um, preserve it at all costs or even worse to, to replicate it so I you know I, I think we had a similar experience more recently with uh, the Bristol Old Vic uh, which is grade one listed in fact and we, we decided that the way to reinforce the importance of the building was actually to lose all of the 1970s work um, by Peter Morrow which was, you know, it was, it was a, a very, very difficult decision to come to and, and, and very, very high risk, um, both, both sort of intellectually and just in terms of loss of heritage material. But we made a case and, and 20th Century Society supported that as did Historic England because it, it felt like the way to, to extend the values of the building and the organisation. So the same thing with the Young Vic. I think um, we were able to make a case that a lot of the fabric was actually dead tissue by that time but the essential relationship of, of the auditorium and the butcher's shop felt germane to the idea of the building which is why we wanted to to preserve that relationship and then grow the rest of the building back out um, from from those fragments but you're you're right i mean we probably demolished 85 percent of the building and did uh, i mean the auditorium in particular um, you know, until you start studying the plans and the project, you, you know, you get the impression when you look at it from the street that it's the same auditorium, it's just got this uh, fancy cladding on now and that makes sense because you've got to insulate the building these days. But when you look at it and you realise that um, half of that block work was taken down, 
was then rebuilt, extended another story. Their, their steel structure was removed, a new steel structure was put in. The right. whole thing was wrapped by a new circulation space. That is, um, you know, it's quite a radical reworking. And yet there is still a retention of some of the fabric uh, when we when we visited this week, we went under the stage and you could see some of the original uh, stepped concrete auditoria from the right. 70s. And um, I guess we wondered if, yeah. if, uh, if you expected to demolish as much as you did when you won the competition or whether um, technical constraints um, as you got into the project suddenly deemed that this strategy had to be much more um, heavy-handed in certain aspects. Yeah, it's interesting. We, were, we knew that the geometry of the auditorium was extraordinarily successful. You know, anecdotally, it, it's one of the best um, yeah, spaces of its size in the world. You know, and that, that's, I think, by common consent. It's so flexible, it's so versatile. And that's partly to do with this geometry, it's partly to do with the number of entrances, partly to do with the, um, the height of the, the first seating gallery, it's partly to do with the materiality and texture and patination of the, of the timber and block work in, in combination. All of those things felt like incredibly precious to us and, and to be kept at all costs. We knew that technically the auditorium was too low it was not particularly safe in terms of working at height. Um, acoustically and thermally, it was absolutely rubbish, um, particularly acoustically. The noise break in and noise break out were really problematic. And so we kn you knew we had to put a kind of tea cozy over it. We knew we had to pr provide another layer of circulation to get more flexibility and connect through to accommodation um, at the far end of the auditorium. Um, but we didn't quite know how much material we would have to retain or, or lose a, between first floor and second floor. But in a way, that was the variable that we had in our mind. And in the end, I think we probably lost a little bit more block work than we expected and, and, and rebuilt it rather than retained it. Um, but we, we used the existing block work and we, we invented a, a very cheap block with a, with a bespoke mix and a bespoke size for the, for the skin of the building otherwise, and, and a glued geometric brick for the for the Maria Studio, which was the kind of complement of the of the mesh and the hand painted main auditorium, those those kind of two principal objects, those, that's those sort of semiotic cues that something significant was happening inside those volumes. You know, we 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 saw the existing fabric as the kind of obviously the first arrival on site, and then we placed the Maria Studio as as a kind of counterpoint object, which then left a kind of void a foyer shaped void as an extension of the pavement, which we then roofed over, as it were, with, with a light steel and timber structure. It feels more that the uh, foyer is part of the street than part of the theatre in a certain way. Very much so. And so you, you know, the fact that we exposed the gable of the butcher's shop as a, as a not that it was an external space, but it has a, a quasi external quality. It had been exposed for many years. And the and the faces of the of, of, of the Lou's and the bar and the and the Maria Studio, they they will have that kind of external continuity as, as they wrap into the foyer. So that that's a very deliberate device. And the fact that you can see up diagonally through to the the terrace for the staff and the offices beyond, there's that kind of sense that yeah, so somebody found a few bob and, and put a and put a kind of scaffolding roof over that space to keep keep the rain off. But broadly, it's part of the street. Behind the bar is, is is really very successful. I mean, I think locals have their own tables, and even if you haven't been to the theatre, many people have been to the bar at some point. And um, uh, when you're in there, it feels it has this kind of very relaxed quality to the architecture. There's lots of um, misalignment between structure and glazing systems. And we, I mean, I suppose it's an architect's question in a way, but we wonder how much of that is composed, or how much how much of it is an acceptance. Um, of an ad hoc approach to assembling systems with a kind of blind faith that it's going to give you the, the hat there at the street. Um. <laughs> I, I, I think 70% the former, maybe 30% the latter. I, I, I think if, 
you know, we set the ground rules. It was a kind of, it's a kind of dogma design process. You know, we, we will not kind of, we'll not try and shoehorn systems into alignment. In fact, rather the opposite, we'll, we'll kind of glory in the disjunct. We, you know, we, we know that these systems in contrapunctual relationships are more interesting, more enlivening than when everything is kind of statically, inverted commas, perfectly aligned. You know, the, the, the imperfection turns out to be more effective than perfection. It goes back to that, you know, those two universes of architecture training to rationalize, to solve, to, to clarify versus the theater practitioner's instinct towards provisionality, towards glorious mess, towards recalcitrance as things which are actively helpful to, to process. And for an audience member, you know, I think it's one of our one of our proudest moments, really, that bar, because it does what we hoped. You know, it kind of, for whatever reason, it, it breaks down those barriers to communication. It, it, it appears to present a really minimal, if not invisible threshold to people entering what, you know, what could otherwise feel intimidating or only for the cognoscenti or, you know, you're gonna, there are rules of behavior which one doesn't quite understand and therefore does that feel repellent? Whereas it's just a it's just a nice bar, isn't it? And it's noisy and it's a bit too small when the audience turn up and there's already 250 people drinking. But that's you know, as as the cliche goes, that is a nice problem to have, and it's it's something which I think has really driven that kind of ownership by by the communities of Lambeth and Southwark, reinforced of course by all the history and 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 good embedding work that the organisation has done to build those relationships and um, and to establish real genuine contact with those communities. So in a sense, what, what we are always trying to do with our, with our theatre work is to understand and maybe develop the organisational software of, of a theatre client and only then decide between us what, what hardware is needed to run that software, as it were. So it's, it's you know, we never go in with, okay, we've got this idea about a building and now we're gonna, now we're gonna invent your brief to, to fit our idea and, and you're gonna have to live with the consequences of our idea, even though we've never fully explained it and you've never quite fully taken it on board or subscribed to it. So I think having time to talk, having time to explore, working with a client like David Lan and his team who are kind of, you know, the ultimate collaborators, you know, they, they 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 bring so much to the conversation and and it always felt like it was a kind of delicious relay race where one of us had the baton at any one time it, it wasn't roger and myself you know leading the client towards this inevitable glorious architectural conclusion it, you know we we, we spent as at least as much time listening as we did talking in in, in those conversations and and David and his team spent a lot of time authoring and inventing and telling us what what the next the next leg should look like. So, I mean, it's it's. I hope it feels like a building which was kind of founded on trust and mutual respect and and a, a mutual willingness to take some risks. Yes, I think it does. I think it does. And I think um, I've read that also the production team was involved in fabrication of bits of the building and that you could um, you would change certain certain things during the build I think handrails or balustrades or something and you could get the production team quite quickly to mock things up and deliver things yeah, yeah what, what we what we did then and it was a kind of became a template for what we've done since is, is maybe include 93 percent of, of the works in the contract with with the contractor and leave the last, you know, the, the last seven or eight percent just at large, by which time we know how much contingency we've spent. Everybody knows what the building looks like <laughs> for the first time, what it feels like to walk around and what it sounds like, what it smells like, and therefore what it needs. So it's it, particularly with a theatre client who's used to inventing environments and they've got they've got an inbuilt design and build department effectively of their own. So we were able to stand back at that point and say, okay, what have we got? How much money have we got? What do we want to do? And of course, you know, we've, we've got provisional ideas about that, but 
at that point, we were able to say, right, we've got the workshop built. We've got all the cutting machinery in. We've got a scenic crew and a, and a load of paint. So let's go. So we made cutting patterns with, with the Young Vic. So we designed all the furniture with them. They then fabricated and installed it, tweaked it. Um, we weren't under pressure for, you know, this change is going to cause this much extension of time and this much loss and expense because the contract was over at that point. Um, likewise, with the, with the painting and decoration, we, we work with the scenic painters rather than a um, standard painter and decorator subcontractor. And, you know, they've, and they're full of ideas. They're full of know-how and can do and, and new energy. And that's yeah. you kind of need that to get you across the line, don't you? At that stage of the project where we're all exhausted some things have gone right, some things have been catastrophically awful, relationships are under strain, you know. Um, and so that it became a new bolt of energy for all of us, I think. And, and we were able to change our minds. You know, we, Roger and I were on site, tweaking stuff, chipping away at bits and bobs, you know, pulling off things which we thought were essential and turned out to look better before we stuck them on, as it were, you know, all that, all those decisions are, much easier to make when you're in that atmosphere and you, you know, you're for the theater client it's that's what happens normally you know you stay up late for the last week tweaking everything and tuning it and that's where the real energy comes from we asked um, some of the production team what they thought of it as a building to work in or to work with and they talked about it being a kind of rare opportunity to continuously build worlds, world after world from the ground up. I think that's, that's very much rooted in this auditorium, which is effectively infinitely reinventable. Um, and so we were interested in that in relation to the original stage, which was sort of um, fixed to the north side, right? mostly a thrust stage, on, and this idea about needing a kind of fixed architectural point to respond to as, as part of the theatre and how, you, how your product has evolved to a different place and perhaps references that you were thinking about at the time, other theatres and how that, those thoughts might have um, developed the project. Sure, yeah, no, it's a really good question. I, I think in this case, we, we were, again, incredibly lucky because we've got 30 years of, of lived experience in that room to work with. And, and in a way, the answers were, were clear you know, the, the fixed thrust was was great, but it was only one thing. And, and in the decades subsequently, people had experimented with, with every sort of format, you know, despite the apparent fixity of the, of the original building. Um, the room is so versatile that you can put it into, you know, diagonal traverse, you can put it into the in the round, you can put it into conventional end on with a kind of quasi proscenium. You can have a promenade production where there's no stage, you know, the, the thing that was always a problem was A, the cost of making those transformations, you know, to, to obliterate the permanent thrust was, was always a cost that may, maybe they didn't need. And also a lot of people spoke about the need for recourse to, a, to just one other world beyond the room. Um, you know, that sort of scenic world, which is, which is a kind of edicule away from the main space. And, and so we made the, um, the workshop capable of becoming that by putting an acoustic door and a removable gallery on, on one other side of the, yeah. the auditorium opposite the foyer. So you've got the original removable gallery where, where the thrust used to be, but there's also a second removable gallery now. And the other thing everybody was always troubled by was the lack of working height. Um, and the lack of versatility at height because you couldn't really fly props or people or you know or bring a more sophisticated vertical world into play so it's around about six meters high which is low for, a, for an auditorium of that height um, so we put in this egg crate of, of, of bridges some of which were removable in the center of the room so you could and they've done this many many times since the building was finished you, you could build quite sophisticated um, scenic devices in, in the vertical. There's, there's been a production where everybody was kind of laying in the middle of the room and the, on the whole of the center of the ceiling was a huge projection surface. For example, Galileo was, was, was that production. And many productions where, where the stage has been in the workshop and, and you know, this, the seating has, 
has, has pushed into that, or there's a thrush stage which can then open up into that second world to great, you know, a sort of coup de théâtre halfway through at the end of the production. So I think everybody kind of knew what the room needed. And it was just a case of us trying, trying to work out the most versatile and cost-effective way of getting as much of that as we could into the, into the finished project. Um, something we haven't talked about yet is the, um, is the facade uh, treatment to the auditorium, uh, the collaboration with Clem Crosby. Um, in a way, this seems like the most, um, the most uh, foreign thing you have introduced uh, to Bill Howell's project. Um, could you explain how that evolved and at what point uh, Clem Crosby was involved? We wanted to try and differentiate the fact that we'd added a lightweight skin around the building. Um, I was saying earlier about what we didn't want to do was simply extrapolate the language of, of the original and replicate it and kind of um, simply produce an enlarged version of, of the original building. So I, I think quite early on we we decided that we wanted to try and put a lightweight skin over it. But we certainly in conversations with David, we, we realized that we wanted to play up the identity of that auditorium rather than the overall identity of the building as a kind of homogenous culture palace, you know, like the kind of cultural building object. We wanted it to be an amalgam. Um, yeah of objects, each of which had their own sort of semiotic significance. So the relationship, as I say, of the, of the main auditorium and the Maria studio was, was the sort of key expression of that. Um, and then the more ambient block work skin, which was running around the workshop and, and the back of the building. Um, and at that point, we were thinking, okay, well, if it's not block work, well, that, what on earth is it? You know, what, what is the equivalent expression materially which which isn't becoming a polished architectural facade exercise a, a kind of exercise in virtuosity or you know for, formal over invention for the sake of it and also what would be affordable so we had um, noticed I think a couple of small projects where this expanded aluminium mesh had been used but we worked with a um, facade specialists um, who, was, who was developing this idea of the, the gauze, which was kind of opaque by day and transparent at night, sort of theatrical gauze yeah. metaphor, I suppose. So the, so the building appeared work a day, if not industrial. You know, that, that reference to the gas works was, was quite kind of present in our minds, you know, almost like the dumb object, yeah. day, but something which is incredibly celebratory and um, ephemeral and elusive but kind of delightful but also something which spoke to the fact that this is not a an industrial product it's not a mass-produced cladding system it, it was literally handmade and hand-painted by an individual so that the, the marks of the hand are directly transferred onto the expression of the auditorium there seemed to be a really lovely correlation between the fact that you know you you that space contained a live relationship and so we went to his studio, we talked about the possibility of these big monochromes, eight by four monochromes around the building. And he got very excited and so did David. So Roger, myself, David and Clem did develop this, this system through sampling, maybe a eight month sampling mm -hmm. um, and ended up with this, with this beautiful, bright sort of buttery yellow um, on the building, which only kind of reveals itself by night. So for us, it sort of feels very young Vicky <laughs> but um and, and in a way it's it's not i agree it's not what bill howell would have done but on the other hand it it, it feels like it's a kind of it has an equivalent sort of weight sort of semiotic and and architectural weight because it's announcing that auditorium so strongly yeah i mean it feels uh, what you're describing um the process always feel, feels very live, the decisions that were made, and you talk about decisions that were made in conversation with David Lamb as you were going along and all these sorts of things. And um, yes, I agree, that's exactly how the, how the building feels. 
but it's hard for us to imagine as uh, an office that competes sometimes in architectural competitions. Um, the the sell of that, the um, I mean, it sounds like a project that evolved as it went along, much you know very differently to you know you've got a you've got a concept, you do some visualizations, you show the client, and what ends up is you know ninety five percent close to how you visualized it in the competitions all those years ago. And I think maybe the nature of competitions has changed, perhaps. Um, but this seems, this seems quite unfamiliar. Yeah, I agree. It, it, I think it's, um, and it's a shame that it feels so unfamiliar, um, in my view, because it, it, to us, it, it almost felt like the perfect design process, the perfect set of relationships leading to a really interesting building that we probably couldn't have foreseen or, or predicted when, when we started doing the, the competition. Um, I think it's something which increasingly is going to come into play. You know, we know that we've got to stop using so much stuff. We know that we've got to stop building buildings that we aren't sure are essential. We know we've got to stop building new buildings if we can do something with the old building. You know, all, of, all of these issues are, are, are more and more pressing as, as the, the planetary emergency un, unfolds. So there has to be a different methodology. There has to be a different procurement for architecture because at the moment it seems that it's, it is predicated on a kind of consumer supplier, an offer which is being made around the building, which is either accepted or not. And competition is by nature. You, you cannot possibly understand the nature of the problem or the nuances of the organization or the client that you're working for until you get into relationship. So yeah. for us, the best architecture is, is a manifestation of the best relationships. And, and almost by definition, that can't be the first thing you think of on, a, on, on your first blind date, which yeah. be what, what competition amounts to. So you know, the, the, the quality of the relationship is, is basically predictive and, and yeah. guesswork at that point. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to get into the ring. You're trying to, obviously you're trying to be attractive in this relationship, but I think, I think increasingly the way to be attractive is to say, the first question we'll ask you is why do you want a building at all? And then we'll ask you if you're sure you do, let's, let's start to think about what it might be like based on what, who you are, what your organization needs. Does your organization need redesigning before we start redesigning this building? Can we be part of that process? You know, so those those upstream interventions of an architectural sensibility seem so much more valuable. And I, and I think if it's if one can articulate that in a competitive situation, I'd like to think that increasingly it's the intelligent, nuanced clients which will begin to hear that and be, and begin to respond accordingly. And increasingly, I think it will be the um, you know the big one-liners which will increasingly start to look anachronistic at best. I hope so. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we might wrap up, Steve, but thank you. Thanks ever so much. It's been, um, it's been fascinating to hear, to hear so much more of the story, so thank you. My pleasure.